Gagan and you're listening to the Voice of Insurance podcast, produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise-scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. The more time we spend in this industry, the more we learn that there's very little that is genuinely new. Take the InsureTech community's recent discovery of the idea of embedded insurance. To read some of the posts about this on social media, this is an idea forged in the white heat of technology and so recently minted that it's still hot to the touch. Well, today's guest puts that idea into considerable perspective. Keith Meyer is Chief Operating Officer of US headquartered Fortune 500 insurer Assurant and has spent a career of over 25 years working in the business-to-business-to-consumer insurance space, or B2B2C, as it is more often called. Operating in 21 countries, there's almost nothing that Keith and Assurant don't know about embedding insurance right into the heart of the product offerings of the world's largest consumer brands. So, this is a very mature sector, and what follows is a masterclass on how to succeed in this specialist niche of the industry. Keith's absolute custom centricity will be a revelation to many listeners from the wholesale world. What's clear is this is a long-term business that needs the right cultural approach to work for all parties. You have to offer real value, or you just won't last. But when it works, it really works. The insurer grows profitable business and service revenues, consumers get great service and added value products, and the consumer giants get new revenue streams and more loyal and better quality customers. What's also clear is that technology is enabling this segment to be so much more responsive than it has been in the past, with new products configurable at scale in a matter of days and weeks at negligible cost. That's clearly the part that's exciting the insure techs, and the growth prospects are really exciting. But here's one embedded incumbent who's way ahead, and it's going to be very, very hard to disrupt. I can highly recommend a listen. Enjoy the podcast. Keith, welcome to The Voice of Insurance. It's good to be here, Mark. Thanks for having me, for sure. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Assurant? Sure. So I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Assurant. We're a Fortune 500 company. And it's an interesting time for me as well, Mark. Today actually happens to be my 25-year anniversary at Assurant as well. And it's hard to believe, but you know, it's a pretty unique company where I've had so many different roles and opportunities. Before being Chief Operating Officer, I was responsible for international at Assurant, serving across 20 countries around the world. So just really amazing experiences and running other businesses and other roles before that. So it's been a great journey for sure. Well, that's a pretty good advert for the business, I would say. And the average insurance executive would have probably had five or six jobs or maybe even more in a 25-year period. I think that's a pretty good advert for your company, for assurance. I was explaining before we hit the record button that I suppose my listenership is very much in the wholesale specialty reinsurance, very much international insurance world. And I'm sure we've all heard of assurance, but why don't you explain what assurance is to those who perhaps don't know that well? So really at Assurant, we partner with the world's largest consumer brands across 21 countries where we offer protection and integrated services and really across our main businesses of mobile devices, auto and home. So when you think of Assurant, we're kind of the brand behind many of the well-known brands that you may know. And you know, really what our role is, we support those companies and those consumers and connecting and protecting their purchases and improving their lifestyles. So it really takes us into a lot of different areas. And when you think about the where the world's going with the connected consumer, being in the industries of the connected auto, connected home and mobile devices, we really like how we're positioned for a lot of interesting growth into the future. When I look at your financials, for example, obviously I spend all my day looking at financials of insurance companies. Now, you know, you look at combined ratios, expense ratios, net written premium, gross written premium, net earned premium, all those lines. Your company presents its financial results in a slightly different way. Do you describe your business more as a service company than an insurance company? Of course, you're an insurance company as well. But how do you describe yourself? Would you say you really are more of a service business? You know, it's interesting. Obviously, I've been with Assurant for a long time. And even in the early days when I joined Assurant, I kind of thought of us as really more of a technology, marketing and services company that has the capability to do insurance. And so us having a B2B to C model is really kind of the core for what we've done over a long period of time. So, you know, it's us selling through third parties in many cases. And then 
really driving great customer experiences at the end of it. InsureTech has really reawakened this term embedded insurance. And I suppose after 25 years at Assurant, you might find that potentially amusing. I don't know. Is this effectively B2B to C is embedded insurance, right? And that's what you've been doing for more than a quarter of a century or probably longer, right? You know, there's nothing better than having buzzwords related exactly to what your business and your core business is. And so with embedded assurance, that's been the hallmark of us for most of our company's history. And I know you're based in the UK, Mark, you know, even in the UK, we've been doing package bank accounts for the banking industry in the UK for at least 15 years. So embedded insurance is really core to the assurance DNA. And so I love that it's the big buzzword now. But when you think about the experience that Assurant brings to the table and and really that unique talent and the abilities of all of our people and where we've been able to grow over time, it's really been all around that embedded insurance. So note to any InsureTech VCs listening, they should probably be talking to you guys. You've got the pedigree and you've been doing this for an awful lot longer than perhaps some of the, uh, the people who've just discovered this as an idea. I suppose one of the classic things about insurance is that we see it as an enabler of commerce. We say, you know, that the ship won't sail, the plane won't take off, you know, and hopefully the surgeon won't make the first incision until they've got the insurance in place, or you won't break ground on a big construction project until the insurer is there to help enable that to happen. Is it part of your pitch to those consumer products companies, largely that you operate with, are you able to pitch to them to say that your insurance actually makes them sell more product? Or does it improve their own metrics in terms of, you know, does it make people renew more or upgrade more regularly or that kind of thing? It's an interesting part because it's not something that our listenership, I think, gets involved with that often. So it's really interesting to pick your brains on, does insurance enable more of that commerce to happen? You know, more mobile phones to be sold or more bank accounts to be taken up? Without a doubt, Mark, that's definitely the case. In fact, our own research has shown that offering support, protection products, and those types of services that breed more loyalty actually increase purchase intent by up to 32%. So as you can imagine, organizations are always trying to think about how do they generate more digital sales and create more of a longer term relationship with that customer. And that's exactly what our products and services do. And it really keeps that customer connected to that brand over a longer period of time. Wow. So they don't just see it as an extra add-on. That's probably where this embedded idea is actually coming from, because you can become a fundamental partner of their business because you're actually making them sell more and probably at higher quality sale as well. Yeah, it's absolutely critical, I think, you know, to the longevity of that customer base. And obviously, if you think about where insurance used to be, it used to be about protecting a customer when an event happened. But more and more, it's creating more of an engagement platform where you're creating more of a relationship with that customer over time. And those are the kind of things that we're always trying to think about in innovative ways to enable that and not just create a, a standard protection program, but create things that actually, back to what I mentioned earlier, improving the lifestyle and the experience for the consumer. So a good example of that is in our mobile business, our personal tech pro product where instead of thinking about it as a protection program, it actually also addresses all the technical challenges. As you think about the connected home and mobile devices, actually getting the proper use out of the device is just as important as fixing it if it breaks. And so as an example, we actually have 31 million customers across seven countries that are utilizing that personal tech growth from Assurant. And the customer experience on that is so critical when we look at the ratings for that, we have an actually a 4.8 average star rating and a 98% resolution rate on customer issues. So it's much better to solve that customer's technical issue than it is for them to think it's broken. And, you know, then they have to go through <laughs> a much more difficult process, right? So we're always thinking about how do we raise the bar on that customer experience? How do we enable our products to create more engagement for that brand and make that customer want to come back once again for the next purchase? That's where that service element is really coming in. So it's way beyond just, hey, I've lost my phone or I've cracked the screen or I've just dropped it in the river or my child has just, you know, dropped it in the water closet or wherever. You've had a lot of experience in this, Mark. <laughs> Let's face it. I think everyone's had those experiences at one point or another, but it's really way beyond. You're almost doing some of those services that you would almost expect that consumer company, you know, that mobile company to be doing itself, but you're almost anticipating some of these things. And of course, yeah. I would certainly agree with you. 
you can use your mobile to do all sorts of things, but it's not that easy to set them all up, is it? Once you've got them working, yeah, I could control my central heating through my phone, but yeah, I don't know how to start. So if I had your plan, I would have somebody helpful on the phone helping me to really use my phone better, right? Exactly. And the, you know, the number of connected devices is just growing exponentially in the home. And, and that's the key. If, if they're not communicating, you're not getting the full usage out of those products. So we help bring all the connectivity together. Would you say that's the biggest evolution that's, that's happening in embedded insurance, B2B to C insurance, however we want to describe it, that that's the biggest evolution and we'll be, be seeing more of that? You know, what are the big developments that you're expecting to see as obviously, you know, the, the amount of connected devices is only going to go up? Sorry to interrupt in mid-flow, but this is just a reminder that you could be advertising right here, right now and getting your message directly into the ear of key decision makers in the insurance industry. And you'll be doing it while they're absolutely in listening mode. The Voice of Insurance has just run through 300,000 downloads. If each of those had had a 60-second ad in them, that would make 83 hours of talking to the industry for a fraction of the cost of alternative media. The podcast is the medium of the future, and so is audio advertising. Contact me on mark at thevoiceofinsurance.com and I'll do everything I can to get you started. There's a lot of evolution that's going to be taking place over the next five years. I think one of the key things is the customers are going to need more and more of these services, you know, just like we were just talking about, right? Like everything's becoming more and more of a connected device. And so it's not just insurance products. It's, it's a lot of related products and services that are going to be really important to bring as well. And that's actually why we recently just announced where we launched what we call Assurant Product Experience Exchange is called Assurant Apex. And really that's our technology delivery platform, you know, for our clients that enables mobile carriers, retailers, financial institutions, a lot of our auto clients, OEMs and dealerships as well. But basically to, to easily add embedded insurance, protection programs, the support that I was mentioning, and other types of services that enable them to better serve their customers. So that was a really key technology platform that we've developed because it's kind of on our DNA in terms of how to bring all these products to life and how to embed them in the customer journey, how to embed them into the purchase path of the customer. And so this way, we basically can enable them to bring new products and services much faster to market than they've ever been able to do before. So we bring basically an integration, an API library that you know, allows the clients to test and review the results of those products really quickly. In fact, one interesting example, Mark, was in the UK, a large company in, in the UK wanted to launch something very quickly. And because of all the technology platforms that we've developed, and they're actually enabled globally, and it also has been set up to be able to configure so you can customize some elements to it. We actually launched one of the top mobile brands in the UK in two weeks for some products that they wanted to enable. So we're always looking for ways to innovate. How do we create more agility and bring the experience that we have on technology and customer experience and enable those for our clients? So that was a great example that just recently happened. So it's really all about this moving beyond just pure insurance. Would you say that's the biggest major trend that it's going to be happening, that you're going to be seeing businesses like yourself really going way beyond just insurance and really interacting with those customers and, you know, and really, really giving them a good experience. Yeah, I think it'll be different products and even expanding the services. So just in your example that you mentioned, Mark, you talked about your mobile phone connecting with your AC units, right? Or yep. your heating system. So that's an evolution where we're starting to create programs that protect not just the device that you've purchased, but also kind of your ecosystem that touches your device. And so that's where we're getting into more coverage for the home and things like that, not just a particular device. And so we've expanded to multiple devices, different gadgets you may have, and then, you know, into the home. So you can imagine there's just a lot of opportunity there for our clients to create even more value for their customer base. So you must be absolute world experts in customer experience. And particularly, I suppose the consumer is evolving all the time. You know, 30 years ago, before Amazon, you used to buy things mail order out of a print magazine and it always filled in this little form and you sent them a check and they would say 28 days, 295 postage and packing and wait 28 days for delivery. And now, of course, you wouldn't wait 
2.8 days for a delivery, would you? I mean, if it hadn't come the next morning, you'd start getting nervous. So consumers have really changed because this is perhaps the biggest part of your product, isn't it? Is I'm going to give your customers a better experience than you could probably give them yourselves. And obviously, and I'm going to give them a lot of added value products and other services as well. So what's the sort of secret? What's the secret source of customer experience? I think you hit exactly on even why I wanted to take on this uh, role. I, I took on the role of Chief Operating Officer at Assurant at the beginning of 2022. And the biggest reason I wanted to do that is prior to that, I mentioned I was responsible for international. I'm, I was talking to clients all over the world, Mark, and ultimately, almost every conversation came down to two things. It was driving a great customer experience and also creating innovative digital solutions for them. Like almost every time I was talking to them, those were the tickets, just like you said, were the keys to driving growth and creating more and more opportunities with these clients. And those are the things that we're building out globally. So we can leverage those capabilities across each of our countries. And as you were innovating in different countries, when you do that, you also then can bring those to bear. So where different countries are at different kind of stages, maybe in digital adoption and those types of things, you can take products that you've developed in one country and then you adjust them a little bit for the local environment and it becomes the next new innovation in another country. And so being able to bring those to our clients was really exciting to me. And you know, taking on this opportunity, now I'm responsible for our technology, our customer experience, all of our operations. And so this was an opportunity that I saw as really being the growth driver for the next three to five years for Assurant and, and for a lot of our clients. So that real strong focus on customer experience is really the hallmark of where Assurant's going to be growing for the next several years. And is it really about anticipating what that customer wants almost before they even know that they want it? Yeah, and I think those are great examples, Mark, where so much of this is about being proactive with the consumer. So digital tools allow us to communicate with customers in different ways. And also, it's enabling us to give them a much more frictionless experience and a better experience to serve them in the ways that they want to be served. A good example in the UK even is, you know, you think about back to your point about is how do you think about assurance as an insurance company or a services company? Well, we actually introduced a mobile repair network called Pocket Geek Tech Repair, where we actually have retail shops around the UK. We've recently just opened about 13 or 14 of them just in the last year or two. And in the US, we actually have over 500 retail tech repair franchises. So we're really, really big in creating that convenience factor for a consumer. And you can imagine how hard it is for different companies to be able to create those kinds of experiences. And not only do we just create that option for a customer to send their device in or go in and get it repaired or trade it in, where we do probably more trade-ins around the world than anyone, it really enables the customer to repair things or upgrade things in the way that they want to be serviced. And then bringing that to our clients in a beautiful digital way where a consumer can go online and actually be able to get steered through what we call dynamic fulfillment we actually can help guide them to the best option for them. So those are the kind of things we have been investing in our digital technologies and also those end customer touch point capabilities that we can then lots of options and lots of great ways for our brands to deliver a superior customer experience that they wouldn't have been able to do before. Yeah. And when you talk about being proactive, one of my observations about the Internet of Things world has been the travel insurance product that says, hey, your flight is already delayed. That's before the screen tells you. That kind of stuff, you can say it's so plugged in, you've already got a notification on your phone saying, hey, your flight's delayed by two hours. Do you want to be rebooked onto this flight or that flight? In the meantime, by the way, here's $100. Go and sit in the nice business lounge, have a massage or whatever, you know, because it's going to cheer you up because you're going to need cheering up because you've missed your connection. That was a great lead in because we actually launched that exact type of product in Korea as an example. So, yeah. but it is really amazing when you can deliver a great experience before the customer even knew that they had an issue. Again, so that seems to be something that's applicable across that customer experience. You know, so it's, hey, we noticed your phone is about 27 degrees, colder than it should be. Are you sure it's not actually been dropped in the bath by your toddler? It's almost like, here's a notification. 
things are happening. You don't want it to be too intrusive, but like remember the old annoying Windows paperclip thing that, you know, there's a Microsoft <laughs> paperclip. You used to eventually had to tell it to go away and stop annoying you because you're busy doing something. So you know, we used to say, you know, it looks like you're opening a spreadsheet. And it's like, yeah, I am opening a spreadsheet. Can you go away? I don't know. But the whole internet of things seems to be able to bring that ability to preempt losses as well but also to handle losses, you know, to reduce the eventual cost of those losses as well and increase that customer satisfaction in no end. So again, is that a really big trend, you know, that you're on this kind of snuffing out losses and also minimizing, mitigating losses because you can tell they're about to happen or they're just in the middle of happening and you can be on top of them straight away. Is that probably the other biggest trend in terms of customer experience and insurance that you see over the next five years? Definitely, definitely. And that's why I've also have our data analytics team well integrated into our technology and our operations. And I think you hit a a good example, Mark, where it's really about using that to create a better experience. So how do we take the information on that customer and actually get in that case where they had that claim, how do we get them to the right resolution and the right positive outcome faster? Yeah. Those are the types of things where we're seeing great progress, where there's certain, call it basic, simple things where we can enable the customer to go straight through and not have to wait on anything because we already have enough information that allows our automated processes to work. So we're always looking at ways to increase our automated intelligence. And we're also very careful about, like you mentioned, uh, making sure it's not intrusive or causing the the wrong outcomes either. So, yeah. you know, we're, we've got a lot of really good guidelines around how do we best utilize our machine learning and our AI as well. I really don't like chatbots personally. I don't know about you. They're just harvesting your name and address and then they, they just don't answer anything. What about things like chat GPT that's been such a big hype for the last few months? Is there any hope there that you know you might have something that's genuinely responsive and actually understands what you want it to do and doesn't just drive you back to the website or, or time itself out and say it's dealt with your query? <laughs> that, I think, has given people a sense of what is possible for the future. And so an example for us is, and you mentioned the chatbots, well, This kind of shows you that there's a better way, ultimately. And for us, we're working already on how would we utilize that. And at the same time, back to you, you have to be careful with what you're doing with with some of these because chat GPT, that can get out into the public domain. So you've got to be really careful with customer information and our client information and things like that. But I think there's going to be a lot of evolution where you have a chat GPT type function, but it's a little bit more in a private environment. And so then you can take advantage of some of that technology that improves chatbots and different things that gets to the kind of standard resolutions much faster. So I think it'll improve those digital experiences without a doubt. Absolutely. What about things like parametrics? Again, you know, something that can automate a claims process is obviously a lot of work and a lot of excitement going into parametrics. Does it excite you equally? Yeah, I think we're always looking for new ways to innovate in our industries. In fact, When I think about Assurant, we actually went public as Assurant in 2004. And most of our business, interestingly, Mark, at that time was in like the health insurance business and credit protection businesses. And now you fast forward, you know, almost 20 years from that time. And those businesses are tiny, if not irrelevant to Assurant. And now most of our business is in that mobile auto and housing businesses. So I think those are the things we're always looking to evolve and change based on what the consumer needs are. And I think to the extent that parametric can serve needs of consumers in unique ways, then we're always looking for ways to incorporate those into our product mixes. Obviously, you're a very tech-focused business, but I imagine that you're happy to collaborate with anyone who's got new technology, that they've got something exciting. Presume you, you don't have the attitude that you can do all of this stuff on your own. You don't do it all yourself. I presume you're open to partnerships, for example. And I think that was kind of the inspiration, Mark, behind Apex that I mentioned earlier, is we can bring our products, third-party products, different types of services, and enable the mix of those to be able to be delivered for our clients. You know, it's funny, we did our release on Apex late last year, and Within the first couple of months, I've received multiple calls from companies you would think could be somewhat competitive to Assurant, but wanting to talk with us about how could they partner with us, you know, leverage the technology that we have, things like that. So 
as many companies as we work with, we try to be pretty independent and, and pretty creative and, and really think about what's the customer need first and then how can we bring that to bear with all the best partnerships, technologies that we've brought to the table and you know sometimes mixing those together to create a great product and a great experience. So again, so you open to all sorts of things. Obviously, there are people specializing in parametrics for flood, a lot of leakage, you know, pipe leakage in households, obviously a huge amount of work in auto telematics, as I'm sure we're fully aware. I'm sure you've got your own offerings in that. But you're talking more about it. It's more of a, like an ecosystem approach where you can give that consumer through that consumer company that you're selling them to, you can give them all sorts of more choice, I presume, you know, because I suppose it's one of my other questions would be, Traditionally, we'd have seen embedded insurance. It's it's very much a kind of take it or leave it thing at the end, and it's a block. It's not something you can mold. It's a hey, you've bought this product, you want this thing, and it's yes or no. And presumably now it won't just be yes or no. It'll be you could have it however you want. I presume again that's going to be an evolution of embedded insurance in the future, and presumably it could even have competitive offerings. Yeah, and in fact, we've actually been developing what we call Protect Select. So based on the name, you can probably gather it kind of hits on where you're going. Part of the challenge with a lot of our clients is you have to keep the message simple to a customer. So otherwise, it's hard for them to sell it. And so sometimes you want to be able to sell them one offer. But then with all the digital capabilities, you can actually configure some of your product choices from a consumer's point of view. That's an example of a technology that we've created that enables some of that flexibility from a consumer perspective where they go, you know, I like this little bundle of services. I like this one a little bit more than that one. So maybe I'll take this one and I don't need that one. And that'll be my bundle. So that's a pretty cool, unique dynamic that we've brought to the table. And then also you can think about that for our clients where our clients may say today, I'd like these three products and services for my customer's bundle. And then tomorrow they may say, you know, based on their work with their customers, I think we might want to add this product or that product, or we might bring them a new idea. And so then we actually enable them to reconfigure that mix of services very easily. Like I mentioned, the two-week implementation for that one client, that historically would have taken many, many months, you know, and to imagine bringing new products and services together. But that's where all that investment up front and knowing where the industry is going and, and having the experience that we've had to be seeing where these industries are going and be able to be a Fortune 500 that can invest ahead of time. You know, I think that gives us a lot of advantages and can create a lot of value for our clients. What about there are other businesses trying to set up ecosystems to help connect everybody to provide embedded insurance all the way to B2B2C as well to, you know, to B2C corporations, as well as brokers, carriers, reinsurers, everybody. Do you see those sort of platforms as a potential threat? Or is it something that you just think, well, actually, we could integrate with all of this, we can integrate our ecosystem with them, and we can just use them as another channel to market if some of these, you know, because these are also some of the ones that I've had words with, they're global, they're developing, they've developed very, very fast. Again, how do you see that? Do you think we might have ecosystems actually collaborating with other ecosystems and interacting at different points? I've always been kind of a fan of competition. I think it just makes you stronger, more nimble, more agile, and always wanting to stay two steps ahead. So my bias has always been I'm kind of pro-competition. And the things you're talking about are things that I kind of call co-opetition, yep. <laughs> you know, where in some cases you may compete, but it, it's also okay to cooperate in other places as well. So that was kind of back to that inspiration on Apex is the future of the industry is, and the world's shrinking too. So you want to bring as many unique products and services that are tailored to the customer needs and our client needs as possible. And to be able to be the one that can bring the best of the best, I think it's a great place to be. And there's nothing wrong with partnering with companies that may have a unique capability that we're not focused on or other things. So I think that's always been us bringing together the right solution for clients. And I don't see that changing. In fact, I think the more the embedded insurance and, you know, there's more attention to this, I think it actually just grows the market more than anything, Mark, which I think is a very healthy thing. And, and it gives consumers more choice and more opportunity to be able to enjoy these services. I'm definitely with you on that because yeah, if you give people choices, it's amazing. Sometimes they make choices that would surprise you. They, they might buy the more expensive cover with actually it gives you less cover, but that's the one they want, you know, because it might just be the way it's packaged for them. It feels right to consume. You never quite know. 
I'm going to jump back to customer service. I want to ask you, being such an expert on customer experience, you know, CX as we abbreviate it, what do you think the dumbest things that insurance companies do in general are? Because I think we can all have our own personal experience and I'm sure everyone can recount their own negative experience. But what are those big no-nos you really try and avoid day to day? I think the thing that comes to mind, Mark, is I think the greatest mistake a company can make is not listening to their customers. And in many cases, sounds like common sense, but it takes a lot of effort, a lot of rigor. We have a literally a customer experience team, an organization that works with all of our areas to really be ensuring there's a focus, not only after the fact, but actually in product design, you know, to be thinking about like, what is that journey? How are we going to make sure that it's as frictionless and, and as strong as possible? And then measuring that all the way through the service events. And then on top of that, understanding where are there customers that didn't have a great experience potentially? And what do we learn from that? How do we identify the root cause? And sometimes those things can be the best pieces of information. Like you mentioned, you'll, you'll discover new things where that could lead you to the next new service or the next new product. And so I think just having a focus across your company for CX and having that in your culture is super important. And anyone that diminishes customer experience is on the side or not core to their business. I think that's going to be to their detriment for sure. Yeah, for me, I have such low expectations. I'd just be happy if I'm ever interacting with any corporation, insurance or otherwise, that when I get spun out of, you know, my query doesn't fit into the first place I've gone into, they spin me out to another department to solve my particular query. You know, it's not in the main 99% of all queries that could be solved in one go. I'd just be happy if they could remember who I was. You know, I have to say, no, it's me. Who are you? Can you go back? What's your policy number? What's your postcode? You know, zip code? What's your address? What's your mother's maiden? Like, well, hang on a minute. I already went through all this stuff five minutes ago. So yeah, for me, just even solving that little problem, say, who is this person who's already given me all this data? Why do I have to keep repeating it? I'd be happy with that. But yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk about that. And, and Mark, you know, I have such a passion for that. You know, just like you described, I mean, the hair goes up on the back <laughs> of my neck when I hear like those kind of things. And Just eliminating really dumb things. You think, well, why is this company so stupid? I've told it all this information and now it asked for it again. It was like, you're driving me crazy. Obviously, we all know government departments that just do that 20 times before you finally get your query solved. You know, but um, anything that's an improvement on that. Our management team at Assurant, we all have a passion for that. And I certainly don't take that for granted at all where, you know, I've been around many, many leaders who are more focused on the bottom line and don't really care about customer experience. And I think that's such a short-term view. I think focusing on customer experience is super important to your bottom line and will ultimately, without a doubt, improve your bottom line You know, over time. So I could probably go on for quite a while on CX, but like I said, I've got a great passion for that. And that's really how Assurant tries to bring value to our clients is you know, really driving and starting with that customer experience in mind. It's a lot of how we talk with our clients. Well, I suppose I think you, 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 because you've put it front and center as your product effectively, then of course you've got to be on it because this is a massive part of what you do and what you're offering to that partner, you know, the, the be in the middle of that B2C B2 equation. What about new products? What do you think? We know all what all the star products of today are and where we see in, as consumers, we see embedded insurance. What do you think the ones of the future are going to be? What are the star products of the future. We can see, for example, you can see things like cyber in commercial insurance has been the star product for the last 10 years. And probably the 10 years prior to that would have been DNO for small and medium-sized corporations globally. What are you sort of gearing up for and getting excited about thinking, wow, this is going to be a major line for us in the future? I'll give you a few maybe examples, Mark. One, it, it actually originated in the UK for us. And we took that concept in the UK and expanded it globally, which was our EV1 product for our auto business. And so if you think about, we're one of, if not the largest auto service contract company in the world. And when you think about the history of what those would cover and with the emergence of all the EVs, the old products were not fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. So we developed new products and we were ahead of the industry on this and it worked so well in the UK that we rolled it out across the globe. And so our EV1 products for electrical vehicles has been a really nice growth opportunity for us, for sure there. And then we talked about mobile earlier as an example. We don't just think about 
protecting that device, we actually think about the life cycle of that device, Mark. And so when you think about the life cycle, that breeds many more products and services. So we're big on doing trade-ins and the upgrades and, you know, how does a customer handle that device at the end of its life, or at least the end of the life that they want it to have. And maybe we'll give it a second life and a third life, which then leads into a big trend, which is in the ESG or the environmental sustainability side of products. And so we're developing products that, you know, really create a better outcome for our clients, for the customers. And we can actually measure the impact that we're having when we trade in a device, repurpose it. We can actually measure the carbon footprint and make sure that people understand that, you know, we're creating more value by taking care of that product that most people aren't thinking about those things today. So we have actually developed what we call Carbon IQ, where we actually can measure it and provide that credit to our clients. And so those are new emerging things. And that originated in Europe. And we're taking that one across the globe as well. So those would be some examples where we look for trends. And, it, and it's great being able to talk to the biggest brands around the world. So it really gives us lots of insight into where the businesses are going. And then when we see something that really can be meaningful, we can develop it and then expand upon that. So th those would be a few examples. That's really interesting. Everything ESG, sustainability, net zero is the way of the future. Is that actually the consumers pushing all of us to do more as the corporates? It's a consumer driven thing. There's a lot of good balance there. You know, I think one, we created these processes because we thought first it was the right thing to do, just like a great customer experience is the right thing to do. But then also when we're talking with our clients, back to when you engage with them, we're here to solve some of their challenges and they're trying to figure out how do they improve their carbon footprint, right, as well. And then, like you said, consumers are demanding more and more to want to be working with companies that are aligned with their values. And so if that's important to a consumer, it's going to have to be important to the company. So I think it's a really good dynamic across all those areas that it's clearly going to continue. Some of it's being pulled by the consumer and presumably some of it's top down because obviously governments are getting involved in this and regulators, et cetera. Yeah. And I think that's going to continue to accelerate for sure. I want to talk about regulation. Obviously, you know, we're in a regulated world, obviously in insurance, we can't not be. And then obviously in that world, particularly when you're dealing with consumers, with widows and orphans and everybody else, we've got to know that customer. We've got to treat that customer fairly in general principles. How do you do that when you're moving at the speed of light? You've got millions of customers and you know, you're digitizing everything. That must be a big part of your job to make sure that not only you're doing a great job, but you also you're doing a great job of complying with all your hundreds of regulators around the world, particularly because you're interacting with consumers, not just businesses. You know, I, I would say even before regulation, Mark, I think it's about values as well. And so when we develop products, we want to make sure that the consumer is getting really good value for that. In fact, even if we can make money on it, if it's not going to create strong consumer value, we won't do it. We actually go through a lot of rigorous processes as well to make sure that customers are treated fairly. So, you know, I think in the UK, there's an FCA fair value regulations and future consumer duties. Those are things that I recall from my international days. Yep. You know, we actually review our metrics on a monthly basis. We have a customer experience forum that makes sure that we're always monitoring and being on top of those things. So we're really focused on providing really great products. And then we're also making sure that we're back to that part we talked about listening to our customers. So if there's any noise or complaints or issues or anything that they're having, we also want to be really responsive to those things and make sure that we're learning from those and always creating even more value for the consumer. So I think it goes back to that tone of what do you make important in your company? So we want to make sure that we're always looking at things for the long term and creating value long term for consumers. I suppose in the distant and dark past of some extended warranty products, we've all heard the kind of apocryphal stories of these kind of heads I win, tells you lose. You know, you buy yourself a sofa and it'll be covered against wear and tear for the next 10 years or whatever it is, you know. But the small print of the policy says, well, if, if you do spill something on it and you need to try to clean it yourself, then you have invalidated the policy. And of course, those end up with these sort of, you know, 1% loss ratios. And they're not great sustainable long-term business propositions, are they? And they don't necessarily enhance the reputation of the insurance industry. So it's really good to hear you say that. So as you've seen in the UK, the FCA has an actual number of a loss ratio in mind and below which it starts to investigate and get a bit nervous, like, is there value? So is, is it around sort of 30 or 40? Once it gets below that, 
Is it something you get nervous about? If you don't mind, I wanted to go back to that example you gave about, you know, when you have that claim and you don't get the value out of it. I think that's where it goes back to. That's way too short-sighted to be thinking that way. We're about like creating long-term sustainable value. We want that customer, when they have that experience, to become more loyal. In your example, you're becoming completely disloyal because that was a horrible experience, right? So I think that's the key that has to be changed. And, and that's the way that we think about these things. And that's why we won't do something that we don't see as bringing value because we think about the long-term value of the customer, not the short-term value. So I think that's the first important thing. And then back to your question on the regulation side, it's such a slippery slope on regulation. I think some regulation is important. And there's a country that is a good example of this, where then you could get over-regulated, you know, Mark. So an example that I remember coming across was one country, they were trying to do what they thought was the right thing and overregulated something to the point where it couldn't be sold anymore. It got, <laughs> it, you know, they put so many hoops in where it's like you literally can't sell that product anymore. So what did people do? They actually created non-regulated products that were a flavor of that, that were way less value to a consumer. And ultimately, the consumers couldn't buy the things that they wanted to buy before that used to be, call it lightly regulated. And then... Now they're buying things unregulated that probably aren't creating the value that they had before. So I think there's a really important balance when we talk about regulations to not overdo it, but make sure also it's there to protect the consumers at the same time. But it's good to hear that you're coming from the right moral standpoint, Keith, on that. And of course, these things evolve all the time. And you're absolutely at the coalface of this, you know, you're at the cutting edge of this where you're doing new things all the time as well. And we're going to have to keep redefining where that boundary between overprotecting a consumer and underprotecting a consumer is. But it's fascinating to hear you talk about it. Do you work with brokers, by the way? Obviously, we talk about B2B2C. Do you ever add an insurance intermediary into that equation? Not a lot necessarily, Mark, but there are some that we do. And you know, as we were talking about earlier, I wouldn't be surprised if more of that happens. When I was mentioning when we announced Apex and you know, some different companies were uh, contacting us, some of them were intermediaries or, or brokers. And that's where they're interested in those technology platforms that we have. And you know, a lot of times they're trying to figure out how do they distribute their products because most companies don't know how to do B2B2C, actually. It's not in their DNA. It's in the assurance DNA because that's the core to our business. But that's where we can maybe help companies that maybe have a hard time bringing products to market where they can leverage our technologies. We can integrate maybe something they're doing with something we're doing and that can be the next new innovation. So I think those are things that, to your point earlier, I think we'll see that evolve more and more over time. And presumably some of these businesses are, uh, maybe they might be introduced to you by some of those large brokers if they're, presumably they're kind of Fortune 500 kind of companies like yourself, and they've probably clients of some of the larger insurance brokers that we all know. I presume, do they introduce you, that kind of thing? Oh, uh, yeah, that happens many times. There's many of the large brokers, we work as partners. So yeah. You know, they'll work in often as like a consultant for the client. Yeah. And so they'll be on a fee basis with that client. And, you know, we'll work with them to enable that client to bring our products, services, and leverage some of the relationship that they have with their broker to bring that to market. So, you know, that happens plenty of times as well. That's interesting because obviously that client needs a lot of handholding because they're moving into a regulated area that obviously might scare them a bit and they probably need someone to represent their side. and get them comfortable with it. Yeah, sometimes we'll do the hand-holding. Sometimes they'll need a third party <laughs> to do the hand-holding, but we're happy to work with whoever the client needs to work with to enable them to feel comfortable to bring those products and services to their customers. Keith, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I think we've come to the end of our time and the main questions, but I'm really, really grateful for you to be able to go into so much detail. And I was probing you on some of those other bigger issues, which I think are really key to making this a long-term sustainable business that is highly valued into the future. Thank you very much for coming on the show. And I hope we'll book a time in at some point in the future to tell us how everything's going. But thanks so much. No, that was a great pleasure. Uh, I really enjoyed it as well, Mark. So thank you for inviting me to join you today. It's been great. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, don't forget to subscribe or leave a like or a review or recommendation on whatever podcast platform you used to access this program. These really help get the word out. Before we go, just a quick reminder that advertising slots are available here and in other places in the Voice of Insurance podcasts. 
Podcasting is the fastest growing medium and attracts a high quality audience of key decision makers. It's also an intimate medium where you, the listener, are right in the room with me and the interview subjects. Needless to say, that means it's a great way of getting your message out directly to an audience because you know you've got their full attention. It's also very cost effective. So get in touch with Mark at thevoiceofinsurance.com to find out how you could be speaking directly to the industry. The Voice of Insurance podcast is produced in association with Advantage Go, enabling enterprise scale underwriting through a single pane of glass. Voice of Insurance is produced by me, Mark Gagan. Music was written by Anna Gagan and produced by Carlos Gagan. Check out more podcasts and written comment pieces at www.thevoiceofinsurance.com.